Today on CityCast Portland, we're talking about Commissioner Rubio walking back her proposal to allocate some of the interest from the Portland Clean Energy Fund to the Portland Street response. We're also talking about Governor Tita Kotek creating an office for her spouse within her administration. And we go into our mailbag for more cocktail bar recommendations and Portland friend making tips. It's Tuesday, March 26th. I'm Claudia Meza, and this is what Portland's talking about. Welcome, everyone, to the Midweek Roundup. Today is a day we look at local stories we might have missed late last week or over the weekend, and we talk them through. How was your weekend? It was good. It's always too short, but I got to go to a few shows and hang out with some friends, so feeling good about it. How was yours? I still don't have a phone. Oh, no. (laughs) My phone died on Friday, and I just don't know how to get to places. (laughs) Every time that I was like, oh, I have to like write down, because I don't have a printer, like old school map quest. Like, think about it. Like, how do you drive to places? You use Google Maps. And I just was like, I don't know where anything is. And I had to like write it out. Mm -hmm. So there was always just something else I could do that like go off like an explorer, like Magellan my way to town. <laughs> and I was like, no, I'm good. So I still don't have it just because I put it off because I didn't want to have to deal with like not really knowing where I was going. <laughs> How are you going to solve this I'm then? I'm so bad. You understand? I'm so bad at directions. That's so funny. I didn't know that. Oh, terrible. <laughs> um, so that was my weekend was uh, procrastinating getting a new phone, which oh. so... I know. My mom probably thinks I'm dead. So anyhow, (laughs) what stories were you looking at? So my story comes from Shane Dixon Kavanaugh at The Oregonian, and he's talking about how Portland City Commissioner Carmen Rubio has walked back her recent offer to provide funding for Portland Street Response, which for context is a non-police intervention program um, that sends mental health professionals and EMTs to assist those in crisis on the streets rather than police officers um, and has always been precariously funded. So this is something we talked about on the show last month, but I'll get into what her initial plans were for those of you who missed it. So back in February, Commissioner Rubio proposed using $3 million in interest from the Portland Clean Energy Fund, or PCEF, revenues to help fund uh, Portland Street Response. And to give some context on PCEF, it's a 1% tax on sales transactions at large retailers and has generated nearly like $600 million in revenue to the city since 2019. So it's created more revenue than expected, and City Hall is having trouble finding ways to properly spend it. But Commissioner Rubio's proposal to spend the money on Portland Street Response was met with criticism from local environmental advocates speaking out against the use of the climate fund for things that are completely unrelated to climate resiliency, especially in communities of color, which was part of why Commissioner Rubio decided to pull back. Um, But her chief of staff did release a statement on the situation, and I'll go ahead and read what that was. So... Following Commissioner Rubio's suggestion of exploring the possibilities around a one-time transfer of PCEF interest funds to the city's general fund, we were advised that it did not follow best practices around budgeting and state financial policy for municipalities. You know, Portland Street response was never even under her jurisdiction. It was always Commissioner Gonzalez's uh, program to oversee. Mm -hmm. And when she came in, I thought was what was interesting was she came in with this proposition. And it wasn't just this. I mean, if you listen to the show, you've been following the saga of the PCEF funds. Yeah. (laughs) She suggested a lot of different allocations for this money uh, that was climate adjacent, that would go through the PCEF committee, that they would then say, yes, that is within these guidelines, but of course, a lot of other more hardline groups who, you know, were advocates for this fund were just like, these are adjacent. These aren't, it's not the same thing. Exactly. So when she came in and was like, hey, I'm, I'm going to basically save this program that's dying, you know, the Portland Street Response, which is a very popular program, but not popular, it seemed. It was reported by Commissioner Gonzalez. It's kind of interesting now um, that he seems kind of like, well, then I'm going to save it. It's yeah. Like, <laughs> it's just kind of funny because it's yeah. like, well, that was a thing that people were asking you to do in the beginning. So, yeah. So you're right. Portland State Response does fall under the Fire Bureau, which is Gonzalez's purview, but he is hoping to use this 
extra piece of money uh, to look into funding more public safety related initiatives, including Portland Street Response. He's talking about proposing that city council uses all of the 12 million in yearly interest from the fund uh, to fund these things and also wants to create a ballot referral to cap the amount spent on climate resiliency and direct the rest of the PCEF revenues to other city related things. For those of you who don't know, this is an important point to make. Uh, Both Commissioner Rubio and Gonzalez are running for mayor. So these decisions are directly competitive and something to consider when reading through uh, what's going on exactly right now with PCEF. Yeah, but also they're similar because here's the deal, though. What Commissioner Gonzalez seems to want to do is actually change city code Mm -hmm. because the only way that you're able to essentially change how PCEF is using the funds is you have to, like an ordinance has to be brought before city council and then that has to go to vote. Yeah. So that is something that Commissioner Rubio was skirting around because the same thing that he's saying, like, hey, this has too much money for what it is. Yeah. We need money elsewhere. She also figured out <laughs> yeah, and was yeah. also allocating. I don't know what, how many other uh, allocations she's going to have to walk back on. But I mean, a lot of people were just like, well, that's really smart. And of course, a lot of other people were like, well, that's nothing to do with what the fund was supposed to be. So the fact that he is essentially doing the same thing, except he's trying to make it so it stays. It's not just like this random thing that happens once. Yeah. It might be a smarter way of going about it. But also, here's the deal. I don't know if you know, Julie, but do you know of all the potential programs, climate programs that PSEF could be funding? I don't. I don't either, actually. Do you see what I'm saying? Like, these organizations must be fighting for something. And I think that, like, their message should be, like, this is what it could be funding. Because right now, it doesn't seem like the city knows what it could be funding. That's a good point. Because if we did, we'd be fighting for something. Right now, we're just like, well, nothing's being done with this money. And the city's falling apart. Like, (laughs) it needs money (laughs) elsewhere. That money should go there. But what these other organizations should be doing is, like, is informing us, like, actually, these are the types of programs we could be funding. Gosh, you know this, what this reminds me of is the arts tax. Yeah. Where people are like, where is this money going to? I don't want to pay this tax. But if you actually know where it's going, then it's much more of a motivator and makes a lot more sense. That's the thing is like, I just don't know enough to say like, oh, it's a great idea to cap it because I have no clue. Mm-hmm. It, it's just kind of interesting to see how all the commissioners, they're like working along the same lines, but maybe not together. <laughs> Do you know? Because I'm just yeah. like, no, this is kind of getting us to a similar place, but it's just different, you know? Very much so, yeah. And and again, we as people in Portland do not pay piece up. This is like strictly for retailers. Um, but yeah, so I don't I don't know. Like mm-hmm. to me, I'm just like, they all seem like good ideas. Like, I just don't know. Yeah, and there will be updates next month too, because it from what it sounds like, Gonzalez is hoping to hold a public city council work session on PSEF. So What will come of that is yet to be seen. Yeah, I'm very curious to see how this unfolds. Mm -hmm. All right, well, let's take a quick break here. And when we come back, more from this midweek roundup. Okay, Julie, do you remember last Friday afternoon when that story hit that three of Governor Kotek's top aides, which included her chief of staff, announced that they were leaving? Yeah, I do remember that. Mm Mm-hmm. And we learned about it like right before we were going to talk to DA Mike Schmidt, which, by the way, that conversation is airing tomorrow. Um, But we all took a moment like you, me and Mike before having our conversation where we're all just like, I wonder who it was. And like, why are they leaving? (laughs) Like, we're all just what's going on? Yeah. Well, a bit later, three people familiar with that situation told Willamette Week that all three of these like key members of her staff left because they had a disagreement with Kotek. So Governor Kotek had a a conversation with their chief of staff over the first lady's level of involvement in the governor's office. Oh, yeah. So those three left because they thought that Amy Kotek Wilson, which is Governor Kotek's wife, was inserting herself a bit too much in the office. Yeah, it's a big deal. Well, here's the deal. So other states do fund staff for the governor's spouse. Other states do actually have like an official office for like the first lady or the first gentleman or first spouse, whatever. Mm -hmm. But Oregon does not. So that's a big reason why people are just like wondering what the hell's going on. Yeah, like that's not how we do things here, kind of. 
it, that's not how we do things around here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So um, Governor Kotek's wife has been attending policy meetings involving behavioral health in the future of Measure 110 and sought a greater level of support, including having her own staff. So now Amy Kotek Wilson does have a master's in social work and has also worked in that field. But like I said, Oregon just doesn't normally do it that way. But the governor's office has confirmed that the first lady does have a state paid office space, which is located within the governor's office. And that starting on Monday, she will also have paid staff. So this paid staff seems to be just one aid um, from what it was reported. Malia Masiba, and my apologies if it's Malia or Malia, I think it's Malia Masiba, She's a state employee currently working as legislative director in the Oregon Department of Administrative Services, and she is moving to the governor's office to support Kotek Wilson. First of all, Kotek's office keeps saying like, hey, policymaking, we do that. My my wife has nothing to do with this. You know, like she advises, she's part of these meetings, but like ultimately our office has the final say. Yeah. Um, her spokesperson was also quoted as saying, Malia will be joining the governor's office as an advisor on a temporary rotation effective March 25th for a six-month rotation that will help to explore the establishment of the office of the first spouse, a program that has been established in many states. This position would also assist and support the current first spouse in her official capacity in support of the administration. So what do you think? You know, I just question and wonder why now is the time to explore something like that when all of these staff members have left. It almost seems like it's not the right spouse to try this out with if there are already <laughs> issues. You know, like why not wait for a time where people are very enthusiastic about having spouse involvement? Yeah. It seems like there was some a clash of, of personalities. Mm. And I don't know, you know, we don't know anything. This is all hearsay. Having three of your top aides leave because of your wife's involvement is kind of odd. Yeah, it is. Well, here's why it caught a lot of attention in Oregon as well, aside from like, you know, we don't do things this way, is that we've had a similar issue arise with a previous governor. It also led to his downfall because he had to resign for ethical reasons, which is actually how Governor Kate Brown came into office. She was not initially voted in. In 2015, Governor John Kitzhaber resigned because it was found that First Lady Sylvia Hayes, his fiance, had gained financially from her office, so they both got into serious ethical trouble. She had paid uh, contracts from parties uh, with a specific interest in policies she was trying to promote, which is not, you're not supposed to do that. And also, she was getting work as a paid consultant by kind of like using her unpaid role as advisor to Kitzhaber, just kind of using it as collateral for these other gigs. And she had to pay $44,000 of fines. Oof. Eventually he just resigned. So here's a deal. The emails were came out and they were just like, you have to separate your personal life. It's just not going to work. Mm -hmm. And so I think something similar is happening where people are just like, dude, what are you doing? Yeah. Do you think Oregonians are thinking back to that history and oh, yeah. anticipating things to go wrong? <laughs> oh, of course. Yeah. But also because like, you're just like working with your with your husband or wife, like, dude, what the heck? Like, <laughs> I know this is like their relationship, totally different. We don't know. But like, I think a lot of us are just working from a very guttural emotional response. Like, dude, it's like, oh, no, <laughs> that's going to be hell for everyone around there. Yeah. Like the first thing was like, well, I didn't vote for her. That's what I was thinking, too. I And by I didn't vote for her. I mean, Governor Kotek's wife. Exactly. So why do they have a say at all in a lot of cases, but enough of a say to have their own office and so on and so forth, like staff added to that. Um, and to <laughs> respond to what you're mentioning about working with your partner, the fact that their offices are in the same room is hilarious to me. It's in the same office, quote unquote. I don't know if it's in the same room. Okay. Okay. I pictured like a small room in a bigger room. Which <laughs> <laughs> insane like a den yeah you know i've never been to the governor's office so i don't know what the layout but i'm just basing this on veep <laughs> nice <laughs> but when you go to the vice president's office there's other offices inside the office or the workstations does that make sense it does make so sense i don't so i don't know if they have like a tandem desk where they're just staring <laughs> at each other <laughs> i just went all the way there in my head <laughs> i don't think that's what's happening julia <laughs> but I know that I would definitely quit if that was what was happening. Like, I'd just be like, I got to go, man. This is getting weird. 
this has got to stop. It's enough. <laughs> but also, like, once you vote for a governor or whatever, it's up to them to create their staff, right? Like, you don't vote for every individual member of their staff. So that is true. I don't know why, like, there is a hesitancy, you know, to accept it. But you're just, I don't know what it is. And, um, and part of me was like, is it misogyny? But it's like, no, they're both women. <laughs> it's, it's like, it's like, it really is a who you. Like, who you? Yeah. Of all things to be met with criticism and critique, this is the type of thing that should, because there is a personal tie there. And yeah. the governor is going to be biased. So everyone else needs to not be. Already, ethically, it feels icky. Yeah. So I don't know. I guess we're going to find out. But again, this does occur in other states, but it's something that has been established. So yeah, like you said, it's it's interesting that it's happening right now. Yeah, we'll see where it goes. These two stories are very much like popcorn making inducing. You know, like you're just like, <laughs> yeah. let's just make let's some see where this goes. <laughs> we're going to see where this is going. <laughs> well, before we head out, there were two notes from the mailbag that I wanted to share. Do you want to read the first one? Yeah, I'd love to. So this one's from Stephanie S. And this is in response to our favorite cocktail spots episode that we re-aired last week. Um, and they said, hi, I wanted to make sure you were aware of Sapphire Hotel Cocktail Bar on Hawthorne, just beyond the road curve at Southeast 50th. They've been voted best cocktail bar in the past and are amazing. I love watching them craft the drinks. Great bites as well with a cozy ambiance and has a history of being a former brothel in the early 1900s. We woo. Have you ever heard of this spot? Yeah. Have you? No, no. This is the first time. You're such a Southeast baby. I thought that you would have gone. I know. Yeah. So here's the deal um, with that spot. I know they're, I could be wrong, but I feel like they're also known for some of their desserts. Mm. Yeah. Thanks for the shout out, Stephanie. Yeah. Thank you. Well, Jessica R., in response to our show about making friends in Portland, um, gave a tip. She's like, I've actually gone to skip the small talk twice since moving here a year ago and have made meaningful connections both times. Two people turn into two friendships and the event itself is a lovely way to connect. I found it on Meetup, but now just go to skip the small talk website to find its events. And I looked it up and skip the small talk is like a psychology based way to meet people. Mm. It's like a research project almost. So I immediately was a little like, whoa, <laughs> whenever I see psychology <laughs> research, I'm just like, no, th no, thank you. Um, but maybe this is like if you're into that, they seem to have like specific questions that you ask mm. or whatever to skip the small talk <laughs> and like, yeah, dive right into it. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like you can get to whether or not there are red flags quicker based off of people's <laughs> responses. So. Okay, we just met. What's your, hey, this is a red flag if she answers this <laughs> any other way? Um, someone who's super enthusiastic about uh, Kanye's latest album. That's a big red flag. <laughs> so if you were just like, hey, uh, what do you think of Kanye's latest album? That'll just, you'll get right to the point. You can just get up and walk away. <laughs> That's a really good question. No, it is. And this is what you say. I miss old Kanye. And then you just go, all right, let's move on. <laughs> The only right answer. <laughs> I would ask how many times you go to Disneyland a year. Oh, that's a great one. Do you know what I mean? Oh, I know what you mean. No diss. I grew up in LA. I know a lot of adult Disney. Disney adults. Disney. I know a lot of adult <laughs> Disney people. I don't know. I know a lot of a Disney adults, but it's a thing. It's a thing. Okay, well, the, the last message is actually from our friends at the Portland Japanese Garden. They want to remind us all that um, they're... Cherry trees will be in bloom this week. Go check that out. Oh. We actually all got memberships as a Christmas gift from our executive producer, which is really sweet. Yeah. I've been going a lot more because of that. Uh, if you have the resources, getting a membership to the Japanese Garden and the zoo has been like life changing for me. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you go to a very beautiful place in part, a part of the city. You just kind of never go if you don't have a reason to. Yeah, it's a perfect excuse. I've yet to go to the zoo, but hopefully this summer. I have a plus one, buddy. Oh, <laughs> is that an invite? <laughs> no, but I'm just saying. I was just bragging. Wow. <laughs> yeah, of course it's an invite. <laughs> so glad I asked. <laughs> oh, man. All right. Well, Julie, thanks so much for hanging out with me this morning. Thanks, Claudia. Claudia. 
Before we head out, I wanted to thank all of our members for helping us keep this free daily podcast going. Kelsey S. joined last week while she was taking a walk listening to our show. I imagine as many of you are now. And she wrote in, I just love the show, your open conversations and laughs, and the length of your episodes. Appreciate the energy you bring to the city. If you'd also like to join and support us, you can do so at portland.citycast.fm. Well, that's all for today here on CityCast Portland. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back tomorrow morning with more from around the city. Until then, see you at Slim's.